Great. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And thank you for the council for inviting me. This is my first visit to Vietnam. And I must say the gala dinner last night was, was memorable. It's one of the best gala dinners I, I've been to. So that's certainly going to be in my memory. So Professor Dunn yesterday made the comment that the best decision a patient can make is to pick their doctor correctly. The one who will listen to you and look after you as a whole patient. And really this is the, the theme of this talk is, is about the doctor-patient relationship. As my only disclosure is the Peripheral Nerve Society funded part of my, uh, my travel here. So I'll start with this quotation, which says, we have to ask ourselves whether medicine is to remain a humanitarian and respected profession, or a new but depersonalized science in the service of prolonging life rather than diminishing human suffering. And I'll leave you with that quotation. So I'm going to talk to you about what is this thing that we call the art of medicine or neurology specifically? Why is it important? What is the evidence that we're losing it? Now this may be more to do with where you are in the world. So certainly in the West, in, in Europe, in the UK, in, in the United States, it may be different for you here in Vietnam in Southeast Asia. And obviously I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Why are we losing these skills? What are the consequences? And what are the sort of remedies we can think about? And I'll be interested to see what your thoughts are on this. So the whole diagnostic paradigm really consisted of the clinical history and examination followed by investigations. That was the traditional teaching of Charcot, Hewlings, Jackson, and Gowers. But that has now been turned upside down to a large extent. And I'll give you some evidence for that, where the reliance is on uh, in the investigations with the with explosion of imaging techniques, whole genomic sequencing, a lot of emphasis is placed on investigations and there are consequences for that. And one example is this. This is a young doctor who wanted to be a neurologist and this is what his neurosurgeon said to him. One gram of gadolinium is worth a thousand neurologists. You know, we don't need neurologists, we need MRI scans. Um, and the neuro neurosurgeon also said um, his face lit up at the chance to preach his favorite message with the great pleasure that neurologists don't do anything for patients, they only give them steroids. He's obviously way out of touch with how, how far neurology has got in terms of treatment. We can treat genetic disorders now. The whole issue about the doctor-patient relationship is really to make a diagnosis. That's why a patient will go to a doctor, whether it's a general practitioner or a very uh, complicated third referral case for Professor Uma Pathy, that is the reason why they're there. But I would suggest that it's not just about making a diagnosis and not just about making a treatment, that really what we're talking about is, is a doctor-patient relationship. It's about communication between the doctor and the patient. And this is a symbiotic relationship. It's beneficial for the doctor and it's beneficial for the patient. It works both ways. And it is about empathy, it's about kindness, it's about being able to treat your patients as you would like to be treated. Albert Schweitzer was a leprologist in, in Lamborghini in the Congo and he came up with this quotation, each patient carries his own doctor with, inside him. They come to us not knowing that truth. We're at our best when we give the doctor who resides within each patient a chance to go to work. And what he's saying is, listen to your patient. They will give you the answers. And I'll illustrate this. Now, the way not to do this is this. Uh, this is a series which you may not be aware of. It's called House. It was in, it's in the United States, very popular in the U UK and maybe Australia. I don't know whether it's, it was possible in, um, in Vietnam. But this is how not to do it. It's a lesion. And the big green thing in the middle of the bigger blue thing on a map is an island. I was hoping for something a bit more creative. Shouldn't we be speaking to the patient before we start diagnosing? Is she a doctor? No, but everybody lies. Dr. Haas doesn't like dealing with patients. Isn't treating patients why we became doctors? No, treating illnesses is why we became doctors. Treating patients is what makes most doctors miserable. So you're trying to eliminate the humanity from the practice of medicine. But 
don't talk to them, they can't lie to us. And we can't lie to them. Humanity is overrated. I don't think it's a tumor. First year of medical school, if you hear hoofbeats, you should think horses, not zebras. Are you in first year of medical school? No. First of all, there's nothing on the CAT scan. Second of all, if this is a horse, then her kindly family doctor in Trenton makes the obvious diagnosis and never gets near this office. Differential diagnosis, people. If it's not a tumor, one of the suspects. Why couldn't you talk? Aneurysm, stroke, or some other ischemic syndrome. Get her a contrast MRI. Crestfield Jacob disease? Mad cow. Mad zebra. Wernicke's encephalopathy. No. Blood thymine level was normal. Lab in Trenton could have screwed up the blood test. I assume it's a corollary. People lie that people screw up. Redraw the blood tests and get her scheduled for that contrast MRI ASAP. Let's find out what kind of zebra we're treating here. That's not the way to do it. All right, this is a complete contraindiction. Um, Michael Harrison was one of my mentors, and in 1975, he published a paper in BMJ looking at general medical patients before MRI scans, all this sort of thing, and found that you could make a diagnosis in 80% of patients from the history alone. And I think we as neurologists, and particularly the seniors, we need to teach the juniors and the medical students the art of history taking. We spend too much time on the examination, whereas we should spend time on teaching them how to take a history and listen. Professor Lees is a, is a colleague of mine, and in his article he wrote, know how to listen, and you will profit from those even who talk badly. And listening is different from hearing, and whenever possible, as Professor Dunn said yesterday, listen to the family as well. They will give you the answers as well. So this is an example of where I stopped listening. This is where I made my mistakes, because I stopped listening. So this was a 28-year-old man referred to me by the infectious diseases team. He presented with problems with bladder emptying and radicular pains in the legs. And when you examined him, he had an absent ankle jerk, and that was it. Now, he was English, he was Caucasian, but he worked in the Congo in Central Africa. He was sleeping in the villages, swimming in the rivers, and eating the local food. His lumbar puncture was abnormal, showed 320 white cells, high protein, low sugar. And his MRI scan, which you may or may not be able to see, showed high signal in the thoracic and lumbar spine just all the way down. So the question was, was this infective? Was it inflammatory? Was it lymphoma? That was the differential diagnosis. But for me, this is only one diagnosis it could be. You know, he was in the Congo, he was swimming in the rivers. And this must be schistomiasis. You know, there's no other diagnosis. Now, I've never made a diagnosis of schistomiasis, which was partly contributing to my thinking. So we sent off the schistosome of serology. We did all the blood tests. And I started him on treatment with praziquantel. He continued getting worse. And then all the tests for schistomiasis came back negative. And these are serologic tests which are fairly sensitive and specific. So what would you do next? Get another opinion? Get another scan? Give him steroids blindly? No, in fact, I had to go back to him. And the history was he had been in the Congo. He had been working there. He came back to the United Kingdom. And then he went back to Scotland where he lived, which is up in the north of England. In the summertime, he was chopping wood without his shirt on. And what he had was a condition called Lyme disease, which you may or may not be aware of, but it's endemic in parts of Scotland, in Europe, in the summertime, tick-borne uh, Borrelia infection. And you know, I'd stopped thinking because I, I'd made the diagnosis almost before I'd actually seen him. And so it's all in the history, and don't try and be too clever. That was the lesson for me. This is a, a paper worth reading, I think, for the juniors. It's, it's about cognitive biases, why we make mistakes uh, in the way we think. Now, when you see patients, there's a mass of information that comes, history, examination, and you have to take shortcuts to get to the answers, and you will make mistakes. No matter how senior you are, you will make mistakes, I guarantee you. Uh, and these shortcuts are called heuristics. And there are various categories. Now, the mistake I made was a framing uh, error because I'd focused on the one word, which was Congo. 
all right? I'd ignored everything else in the history, and that was a framing error. There's another one at the bottom for blind obedience, and this means for the juniors, do not just observe and, and follow your seniors blindly. Think about patients, think about diagnosis yourself, because you will find things that your seniors have missed. So avoid blind obedience. Neurology is a fascinating subject, and one of the fascinations is about observation. There are three classes of people, those who see, those who see when they're shown, and I'm afraid there are some people who just do not see. Now, David Marsden, you may have heard of, was a big player in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders, all right? We used to genuflect when he walked by at the hospital, you know, it was that, that, that much. But he was the best clinician that I ever worked for, and he came up with this Rolex sign. Now, David Marsden had a lot of private patients from all around the world who came to see him for their Parkinson's. And a lot of them presented when they had their Rolex watches costing 10,000, 15,000 pounds, stopped working. For those of you who have a Rolex, it is a self-winding mechanism. So if you lose your arm swing, the watch will stop winding. And they used to then complain to the watchmaker that my watch has stopped. But in fact, this was the first presentation of the unilateral loss of arm swing of Parkinson's disease. And it was called the Marsden Rolex sign, just an observation which makes neurology so interesting. What about the examination? We do spend a lot of time in the examination. And one of my colleagues in London, Chris Hawkes, wrote this article. I've stopped examining patients, and this caused a huge consternation amongst the neurology community in the United Kingdom. The editor of Practical Neurology was lamblasted for accepting this article. But it was tongue in cheek. And he says, OK, I don't examine patients on the couch, but I do examine them when they walk into the room when I talk to them. And he has documented all his cases. There are some which you thought it's odd. You, you would have to examine these patients. Dizzy patients, if you've been to Uma Pathy's lecture, you have to examine them with the head impulse test or the, the whole pack test. You cannot get away from a dizzy patient without doing those tests. And they can be very satisfying. And the reason we examine is this. All right, Bill, what do you got? Well, the patient has several neurologic deficits, but it's OK. He's not here. You can say it. I can't localize the lesion. Oh, really? Oh, no. I'm surprised you can localize your shoes every morning. We thought you were on vacation. Oh, I was. But I could hear your incompetence from over 2,000 miles away. It was deafening. That makes sense. Well, please tell me more about this unlocalizable lesion. Well, the MRI was normal. Wait, how long was I gone? Uh, wait, what? When did we learn how to replace the prefrontal cortex with a tiny little radiologist? Well, that's not the only thing. The patient has contralateral hemiparesis, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and horizontal gaze paresis. Where is the lesion? Um, it, come on, Bill. Synaptic transmission should only take 0 0.5 milliseconds. Did you run out of neurotransmitters? Uh, the pons. Well done. Attending, you can cancel Bill's stroke workup and just focus on the patient. All right, Bill. That's why we examine patients, is to confirm the localization from the history. You examine patients because is there a systemic disorder, HIV, lupus, malignancy. We evaluate functions such as gait, such as swallowing, by examining patients. To assess change, you have the EDSS for MS, the Glasgow Coma Scale. To help address his treatment for areas of treatment, so spasticity, you need to examine patients for all this. And there are some symptoms you just cannot diagnose without examining them. Now, this video doesn't work, but this is a functional tremor. You cannot diagnose a functional tremor on video or particularly on, on the phone in remote consultations. In resource poor setting, and this is what Professor Mopathy has been talking about, you need to rely on your clinical skills. So I was involved with setting up a medical school in Mozambique about 15 years ago. And this is the ICU. You know, there's a CT scanner which works sometimes. A lot of times it didn't work. And you had to rely on your clinical acumen to make decisions about doing lumbar punctures, about starting treatments. And so I think, especially in some parts of the world, you cannot rely on, on investigations. Again, I come back to the doctor-patient relationship, and this is about the laying on of hands. And I'll, I'll give you an, a personal example of why I think this is so important uh, about touch and, for example, just simply taking the pulse. And I've tended to do that even now when I see patients by the bedside. I will just hold, take their pulse 
more out of habit now, and some of the juniors find this a bit strange, is why is he doing this, you know? Um, and, and then finally, even in the, in the days of whole genomic sequencing, these are all the genes you have for shark and marry tooth, but they are useless unless you have good phenotyping. You need good clinical phenotyping to correlate with the genotypes. Again, examination, very important. Now, the neurological examination is very personal, very subjective. Some people start at the top and do an examination top to bottom for all their patients. Some focus on the problem that's necessary. For example, carpal tunnel syndrome, they'll focus on the hand. Everyone is different, but I think the younger members really should get into the habit of doing a proper examination because then you'll work out what's normal and what's abnormal. Okay? Don't take shortcuts too early in your career. And neurology is an apprenticeship, and this was evident from the, the, the senior members yesterday who were being awarded various prizes. And they all talked about teaching and how important it was, because in the end, the only thing you leave behind are the people you've mentored and taught. Uh, this is from Andrew Lees. As a trainee hospital doctor, A.J. Lees was enthralled by his mentors, esteemed neurologists who in their work combined the precision of mathematicians, with the solemnity of undertakers. Don't know about that. Today, there are clinical methods honed at the bedside are in danger of extinction, replaced by a slavish adherence to algorithms, protocols, process, and a worship of med machines. It's the so-called McDonaldization of medicine, really. And these are my, my, my mentors, but they passed on gems which are not in any of the textbooks. So as an example, Peter Harvey, you have a patient who has a functional coma if you take a tuning fork and you vibrate it and stick it in the nostril, I guarantee you it will wake up the dead, all right? So these are all tricks of the trade which have been passed on down the years, not in textbooks, although I've tried to put it into my Oxford handbook, but you know, they come with, 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 with mentorship. So what is the evidence we're losing these skills? And this was my own experience. So I, I do some work in Kenya about six years ago, I was horse riding, fell off the horse when he was spooked by a snake, Six fractured ribs, hemothorax, fractured clavicle. Now, I was in hospital for two weeks in Kenya, then transferred to the UK. In three weeks, not one doctor examined me. They looked at my chest x-ray, they looked at my blood test, and walked off. And then, four weeks later, a professor of chest medicine came into the room, he took off my pajama top, percussed my chest, lisped to my chest, and me as a physician for a number of years, then felt that I'd been taken seriously and somebody was looking after me, all right? And this is important. This is the message. I did go back on the same horse three years later. You know, you have to do that. Richard Horton, you may know about the journal called The Lancet. He's the editor of The Lancet, and he's obviously been unwell in the last few years. And he wrote an article soon after my experience when he says, why don't doctors touch patients anymore? <laughs> Having had the privilege of attending clinics, in the National Health Service, history taking is cursory exercise. I can honestly say that at no stage has any physician, surgeon, or anesthetist ever completed anything approaching a physical examination. This is the state of play of medicine in, in, in the UK, in, in Europe, and in the United States even. I'll be interested to see what people say. He talks about that he had every investigation done, he had every biopsy done, um, and he says, no abdominal examination, and one's nervous system might simply not exist. I've tested these perceptions with friends who are still practicing patients. They're surprised that I'm surprised. As another example, internal assessment. This is in the US. They were asked to assess patients in coma, uh, and 80% went straight for a CT scan first. Only 40% actually did the clinical examination as part of the initial assessment. So just another piece of evidence about the reliance on, on, on investigations. But what about the consequences? I've talked about the dehumanization of medicine, where efficacy, efficiency is more valued than, than, than kindness. It's like going to the supermarket where it's all automated rather than seeing one person face to face. My mother was in hospital about a year ago, 87, had a femoral hernia, repaired overnight, 
And the surgeon wanted to send her home the next day. I said, no, you cannot send her home the next day till her bowels are moved, till she's pain-free. But it was this sort of mechanization of, of fast-tracking everyone out of hospital. What about the results of over-investigations? Vomit is victims of medical imaging techniques. Okay? You see a patient with a headache, you do a scan, you see an arachnoid cyst, which causes great panic and, and, and anxiety amongst patients. In the US, $1 billion is spent a year on investigating headache patients, okay? Because they all get MRI scans. Bath is another uh, abbreviation called brainless application of radiological findings, okay? So you see a patient, you do a scan, and then you follow the red herring the wrong way down the, the road because you've been, in, you've been uh, investigating them too much. I've talked about the economics in the US. There are medical legal consequences. In the UK, between 2007 and 2012, there were 120 claims against neurologists. In 30%, this was because of an inadequate history and examination, and the cost to our National Health Service, five million pounds, okay? So there are consequences. And I think this lack of clinical um, rapport with patients is a cause of loss of job satisfaction. So in the United Kingdom, about 40% of junior doctors, after completing their core medical training, leave medicine or they leave the country. That's the statistic we've got in the UK now. Why is this art being done? There's no doubt that time pressure is the most important. So in Vietnam, I think there's one neurologist for 250,000 patients. You haven't got the time. In Timor, it's 1 to 1.3 million uh, per population. So. Time pressure is, is a crucial factor because you need time for history and examination. I think super specialization is another problem where, where at Queen Square where I work, we have 150 neurologists all specializing in their own little, little area of medicine, but they can't deal with anything else apart from their, their own specialty. Whether it's hyperactive movement disorders or hypoactive movement disorders, we had a professor of pupillometry at Queen Square and all he did was look at pupils all day, every day, all right? That's how super size you can get. We have computers. I don't know whether you have the same system here, but I think in the US you have Epic. And you know the clinic is governed by Epic because you're looking at the computer all the time and not focusing on the patients. Um, and I think medicine perhaps has become more of a profession now. Maybe rightly we, that people are worried more about their work, work, um, work play interface and not a vocation. So I think the remedies are we need more doctors, we need more neurologists, but that's easier said than done. I think we need to teach the medical students about taking history and examination. We need to be mentoring juniors. And I think mentoring works in both ways. You know, the juniors can mentor the, the seniors. I'm certainly being mentored by my registrars about, about using the computer and what are the latest genes that are available, which I have no idea. I can't keep up with them. Maybe using um, clinical assistance, and but the new generation is about remoteness. You just have to be walking into a restaurant, everyone's looking at their phones, no one's talking to anything. That is the new normal for people. Um, and maybe it's just something uh, which is a generational gap. And there's a loss of continuity as well in our patients. So I'll finish with this TED talk by Abraham Varghese. He's a very he's an author a and an infectious disease. What rounds looked like uh, the sound when, when I was in training. The focus was around the patient. We went from bed to bed. The attending physician was in charge. Too often these days, rounds looks very much like this, where the discussion is taking place in a room far away from the patient. The discussion is all about images on the computer, data, and the one critical piece missing is that of the patient. Now, I've been influenced in this thinking by two anecdotes that I want to share with you. One had to do with a friend of mine who had a breast cancer, had a, had a small breast cancer detected, had her lumpectomy in the town in which I lived. This was when I was in Texas. And she then spent a lot of time researching to find the best cancer center in the world to get her subsequent care. And she found the place and decided to go there, went there, and which is why I was surprised a few months later to see her back in our own town getting her subsequent care with her private oncologist. And I pressed her, I asked her, why did you come back and get your care here? And she was reluctant to tell me. She said, you know, the cancer center was wonderful. It had a, you know, 
beautiful facility, giant atrium, valet parking, a piano that played itself, a concierge that took you around from here to there. But, she said, but they did not touch my breasts. Now, you and I could argue that they probably did not need to touch her breasts. They had her scanned inside out. They understood her breast cancer at the molecular level. They had no need to touch her breasts. But to her, it mattered deeply. It was enough for her to make the decision to get her subsequent care with her private oncologist, who every time she went, examined both breasts, including the axillary tail, examined her axilla carefully, examined her cervical region, her inguinal region, did a thorough exam, and to her, that spoke of a kind of attentiveness that she needed. I was very influenced by that anecdote, and that rituals are all about transformation. We marry, for example, with great pomp and ceremony and expense to signal our departure from a life of solitude, misery, loneliness, to one of eternal bliss. I'm not sure why you're laughing. That was the original intent, was it not? We signal transitions of power with rituals. We signal the passage of a life with rituals. Rituals are terribly important. They're all about transformation. Well, I would submit to you that the ritual of one individual coming to another and telling them things that they would not tell their preacher or rabbi, and then incredibly on top of that, disrobing and allowing touch, I would submit to you that that is a ritual of exceeding importance. And if you shortchange that ritual by not undressing the patient, by listening with your stethoscope on top of the nightgown, by not doing a complete exam, you have bypassed on the opportunity to seal the patient-physician relationship. I am a writer, and I, I want to show you. So I'll finish with that. So medicine is not just about making a diagnosis. It is about the holistic approach to a patient. It's about managing the consequences of a patient's illness on him and his family. It's about empathy. It's about a connection between the doctor and the patient. The art is being lost. There are consequences, and there are some potential remedies that I think are possible, but perhaps easier said than done. This is our neuromuscular group at Queen Square. And I will just remind you about the PNS meeting, which is in Montreal next year. There are various grants and scholarships available. So if you're interested, I would strongly advise you go to the website uh, and look up the, the agendas there. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll finish there.